Um, Winnie and I are very focused on the use aspect of barcodes rather than on the production aspect of barcodes. And um, we're here because Paul invited us to a conference back in 2003 where he um, got in a huge fight with the whole genome people about the possible use of a little tiny piece of DNA. And parts of that story will unfold as I go along here. But I just want to say, I want to acknowledge that the only reason why Winnie and I are here in this and making this whole presentation is because of Paul's initiative with, uh, with eyeball or with barcoding, if you like. Now, this slide is a very bold statement. But I want you to notice the word biodevelop Costa Rica for itself and to be an example for the world, to be a model tropical country for use of its wild biodiversity. So I'm talking about the use side here. And the other slide is in Spanish because I normally give this talk in Spanish to a Spanish audience because they are the users. All right? You are aphids stuck on the plant. Okay. Now, the word for the project is bioalpha, which is derived right from that, which is really bioliteracy in Spanish. And the whole goal here is to render Costa Rica a bioliterate country. Okay. Winnie and I are here because we're trying as a sort of insane belief to help wild biodiversity in the tropics survive indefinitely. My normal audiences, our normal audiences are 5 million Costa Ricans. They're not the people here. They're not the CBD in Egypt. They're 5 million people in one little country. And what is biodevelopment really? What do I mean when I say the word biodevelopment? I mean, find the species to know what they are, organize the data about them, put it on the internet, and integrate that information with the sectors of those 5 million people. That's what you do to create a bioliterate country, a country that says we want wild biodiversity to be part of us. Like they say, we want highways, we want hospitals, we want schools, we want the internet. We want them to say, we want the wild biodiversity as well. So what that really boils down to is it'll be the first tropical country in the world to actually know what's inside of it. And the other is, what does that no mean? It means what it is, where it is, what's it do, how to find it, how to get it on the net, and have it become known. That's what we mean, and that's where we're focused. This is biodiversity development, but it's really just real estate development. Just like you're building this hotel, you have to think about the clients, about the laws, about the, about the, the, the prices, the taxes, all those other things that go along with building a hotel go along with this as well, all right? And it starts with the government, it works it all the way, all the way down to a NGO here registered in the United States for one purpose, so that it can take income, and the donor can be allowed to deduct that from their taxable income, okay? This is the real estate in Costa Rica. Here's the country here. Transposed in the United States is the size of West Virginia. That's Costa Rica's real estate. But in our terminology here, sorry, my, my battery's going weak on that, so I'll just do it. Oops, sorry. This is Costa Rica's real estate. 4% of the world's biodiversity occurs in that little piece, and 4% is sitting there. So that's the raw material that this country has to work with to become bioliterate, okay? We're estimating right now a million species, but that's too low, but we'll start with that. And we think of these as clients or shareholders. And the idea is that they're there in the perpetuity, okay? And this, sorry, this is a shareholder interview. These are school children, farm school children, in a biological education program run by the conservation area. The teacher sent this because he was very proud of the fact that his fifth-year-old student knew how to handle the snake, show it to people, not threaten the snake, da-da-da, understand his natural history. 
What I saw in the photograph, which was sent to me, was one, two, three, four, five cell phones from farm kids whose annual family incomes tend to be $10,000 to $15,000 a year for the whole family are pulling iPhones out of their pockets. That is the world that we are living in, okay? It's not the Natural History Museum of 1850. This pilot project sitting right up here called the ACG or Área de Conservación Guanacaste is where the idea sort of took root of biodeveloping a national park into something wanted by the country as opposed to something set aside by the country. And until 2000 and 2003, we were still stuck in the model of doing that a la 1850, okay? Costa Rica's biodiversity is in all these white areas that you see around here, but in fact, all the stuff on the agricultural landscape occurs in those white areas as well. So even if you just did the national parks, you'd get the whole package, all right? 65% of Costa Rica's biodiversity is in this little yellow piece up here, which is the size of New York and its suburbs. And on the front door, it has the word development. It's the only national park in the world that's got the word development on its front door. That won't be true 20 years from now, but that's certainly true at the present time. Now, what does development really mean in pragmatic terms? It means you find the bug or the plant or whatever it happens to be, you bring it in, you record data about it, you photograph it, you do all that sort of stuff. That creates an ordinary record, just a pedigree, if you like, the same kind of thing we're all talking about here, and that goes straight into some kind of computerization, and that goes straight into somebody's brain. That is the loop that we're dealing with. Okay? The people who do that, in our case, are called parataxonomists. These are people who make a career out of doing all the things that you've just been talking about. What Mark would just describe to you is what they do full time and have been doing so for 10, 15, 25 years. Okay. There's only, in that photograph, there are only two university degrees. All the rest of these people would have been swinging a machete or washing dishes or babysitting. Okay. And this is product. Okay. Now this kind of product is what we, for a very long time, for 25 years, were filling your institutions with. The Smithsonian, this is the Smithsonian in this case, cabinet after cabinet after cabinet, filled with specimens, put in the Smithsonian as vouchers for information. This is prior to barcoding. And at that time, up to, 19, up to 2003, our way of dealing with taxonomy is the way you all know about it. We look at them very carefully and we try to figure out is there a difference between them and maybe we match it with ecology and that's it, all right? But in 2003, this crazy man right here <laughs> stood up in front of about 35 whole genome people and said, I just want a little tiny piece. And they did not like that one bit because that was a new kid on a block. It was a new kid in their territory, and it was a new idea. And the reactions were negative like you couldn't believe. And the sponsor who paid the bill for this conference went away from this meeting, bright red in the face saying, there's been no result from these three days. I can't stand it all. I'll buy lunch, lunch and I'll buy dinner in New York City for anybody who can give me a solution for how to deal with barcoding. It was a very unpleasant event. At the end of this event, I gave Paul this box of butterflies. And I said, I'm the only person on the planet who can identify them because I reared them from caterpillars. Will you take them home and tell me how many species are in a box? Two weeks later, I got an email from him telling me exactly how many species are in the box. He had never seen these butterflies in his life. And he got all perfectly right, okay? That was enough for me. I'm an ob observational field ecologist. I see an animal die when you put a big bullet through it, I'll figure that every other animal you put a big bullet through is gonna die as well. <laughs> so, this guy right here, who's sitting in the back over there, Scott Miller, invites Paul, the deer in the headlights, to come <laughs> and give a talk to the whole Smithsonian about barcoding. 
And the whole Smithsonian fell on him. Boom! Out of here. No way. Well, we sort of were shuddering because we had strongly recommended that they should be listening to this guy, all right? And at the same time, we had this box of butterflies, actually repeated by box after box after box, which by their biology said there has to be more than one in that photograph. Because these are butterflies and they were eating 53 species of food plants, the caterpillars were. No butterfly eats 53 species of food plants, none. So there's something wrong. And our really high quality Victorian taxonomist staring at the box said, I think there's more than one thing here, but I can't tell you how to tell them apart. So Paul goes home, looks like a, looks like a drug deal, <laughs> going down with 473 legs in his briefcase of those butterflies. They go to this building that you're sitting in now. They go into that machine that you all know or further additional ones after that. And out of them came real barcodes. Okay, that's a real barcode. The way I explain this in the world I deal with is it's a one word made up of four letters, 650 words, 650 letters long. And then everybody in the room has got the same one. And that's enough. A politician understands that. Okay. So we go back to this box. There's actually 10 species of butterflies in that box. And this thing really hit the taxonomic world as a sort of a, uh, a wake-up call. All right? We all know that there are cryptic species. Of course we do. But the fact that you can be, pull them out like that was a very startling thing, very interesting thing, but very disruptive as well. And there are exhibits of this thing in museums all over the world of showing how, wow, what you can do. All right? That was enough influence for me. These are the caterpillars that go with those butterflies. And you can tell them all apart by their caterpillars and by their food plants. But the records were gathered one here, one there, one here, one here, over like 30 years. And I never put them together to sort them out like you would in an NJ tree today. Okay? I didn't have a way of putting them together and sort them out as an NJ tree. But what barcoding did was give me that. Okay? So they're actually telepartable. But the genitalia, you all know, you all know, but butterfly genitalia are very good taxonomic characters in general. These guys all have identical genitalia. Okay. The world record right now is 39 species inside of one box. This is one name for 113 years. With barcode, they turn out to be 39 species, each one with its own species of caterpillar to parasitize, all living in the same place. Okay. So that's what, oops, sorry. That's what caused my estimate for butterflies to move from 9,500, I mean 9,000, excuse me, to 15,000 for the ACG. Was looking at that and realized, whoa, there's a whole lot of stuff here that we've just been superficially going over. So what does that look like when you take families of, of in this case, insects, of top, these are Lepidoptera down to there, and then flies and two wasp families here, and you, do, you take the bins, and you take the number of species. Now, these are species based on ecology, morphology, and clustering, and there may only be a tenth of a percent difference between them and their barcodes, but they're real species. You take those, and you compare them by their bins. It's very easy. If you tell me there's 1,000 bins, I'll tell you there's 1,100 species in that cluster, because it averages out to 10%, and these are the actual figures for these families of butterflies, over 179,000 individuals. So we're, we're, we're dealing with a world where bins can work and barcodes can work. But you, if you really want to know how many species are there, you upgrade the number of bins. So at the end of the day, we end up with a pedigree, specimens, a whole lot of barcoded things sitting here in Guelph, and a barcode for each one. That's the basic information that the user out there can handle, understand, politicians and school children understand this, it's very easy to convey, all right? Here's what you looked like in 2014. This is Rod Page's map just pulled off the web of where the barcode records were from on a global basis. And this is what Costa Rica looks like. Uh, this is Nicaragua up here to the north, and here's Panama down here to the south. 
The reason why this has all taken place is because the political structure, the civil service structure, the middle managers, the ministers, got to understand the simple lesson, the simple concept that a barcode is like the name of a person or like the title of a book. It's not part of the genome. Of course, literally it's part of the genome, but in fact, it's just one little tiny character. And so therefore it can be public domain. So there's not resistance and has not been resistance to all this barcoding that you see here. That's 450,000 specimens from Costa Rica itself. Okay. And on the front door, as I said before, is the word development. So what's the raw material for this development? These are the insects. These are the other groups, the riffraff, you know, all the vertebrates and the scorpions and the, all of the other kinds of stuff. That's the raw material. So the question is, what society asks is, well, can we put this to work? How do we use that? Okay. Well, I think you all know the story. I have to thank Merdad for that malaise trap. I don't know if Merdad's here or not, but there he is back there. Merdad left nine malaise traps sitting in the ACG. And um, the story I'm about to unfold here comes about because they were just sitting there, not used. They had been used, and he had left them there in the ACG. And I, opportunistic me, snatched them up and used them this way. So that's a malaise trap, and I just want to show it everybody. It's a tent with a door open, and um, the insects fall in the container that goes up there, and they end up looking like that. And whoops, sorry. And then the question becomes, of course, that they're all undescribed and they're all impossible to identify. This is not Kansas. This is not Ottawa. This is a world where 98% of what you catch has no name, okay? No keys, no illustrated photographs, nothing, all right? So we have not ever thought about using this kind of stuff for anything, but you couldn't identify it. Well, the interesting analog was produced by one of the park people. This is a weather station. Now, what's a weather station do? Collects drops of water. And then you have to use the drops of water to make statements about agriculture, about hurricanes, about all kinds of the climate, all kinds of things. You use that data. Well, a malaise trap is just the same thing. It's just collecting drops of insects instead of drops of water. Okay? And now we have a way of doing things individually to those drops of water. Just like if you could take each drop of water to fill in here and know where it came from, what time of day it fell, what kind of chemical composition it has, imagine what you could do with a weather station. Okay? So let's look harder at the mice traps. You all use them all the time, but the striking thing is nobody's out there testing them. This is the ACG here. 2% of the country and uh, the size of New York and its suburbs, as I said. And uh, there's a malay strap put right there, one right there, and one right there. That's about uh, 10 kilometers there, and it's about 20 kilometers there. So let's look at those malay straps. This is one in cloud forest, this is one in dry forest, and this is one in rainforest. Okay, very short distances between these. This is a year's worth of insects portrayed as bins for those three traps. 17,000 bins, 31 in common. Now absorb that. 27, 17,000 bins in a little tiny area that any taxonomist map of Costa Rica would just show one dot. 31 of them are in common between those three traps. Okay. This is expanding to a bigger area, and adding this circle right here is seven pooled malaise traps against the same two you were looking at before. So now we're jacked it up to 21,000 bins, and there's 131 income among them. And the distance from one to the other, from this is from this to this, the distance to that is five kilometers, 10 kilometers. Okay. We haven't begun to touch what's in the tropics. Now that's looking at all the sets. If we break them down into flies, beetles, wasps and bees, and Lepidoptera, we do the same three traps. For, for flies, out of 9,000 bins, there are 25 in common. For, fly, for beetles, out of 17, 1,700 bins, there's one beetle in common. 
Out of 1,400 down here, Lepidoptera, there are zero in common. For Hymenoptera, we have a giant two in common out of nearly 3,000. So you think a malaise trap is sampling what's there? This is a whole year through the whole season. Okay. These are ants. Well, we, what we knew, we thought we knew, 527 species of ants living in the, in the ACG, found in every way you can possibly think of, right? We go out and put malaise trap out there in the middle of the forest that's produced this. 26% of what falls in the malaise trap is, in, is overlaps with what we already knew there. And there's 143 new species in the malaise traps that were not caught by any of the standard ways of catching ants. These are flies, decayed flies, you know, this is, this, is, this is the perfect thing to be caught by a malaise trap. The national estimate by hardcore good taxonomists was 2,000 species for Costa Rica. We have reared, just from caterpillars, in this one forest, 974. Half the country fauna supposedly occurs in this one little tiny place. Uh-huh, of course, right. Now, we go out and we put malaise traps out there, one in the dry forest, one in the more rainy forest, in the same place that all these flies were reared. There are 0.07% of the species of tachinids there that have been caught in this malaise trap. Think about what fraction of the fauna you're getting in a malaise trap when you put down a malaise trap. Okay. These are the estimates made by the old time guys who did morphology, 17,000 species of Hymenoptera for Costa Rica. Just looking at what we reared, we're already reared 122% of those, of the Hymenoptera. We reared 59 of them for ichnomonidae, 122% for Burkonidae, 108% for ants. I, I just am overemphasizing probably the fact that there's just a huge set out there that we're not touching yet. And that's got to be added to all this stuff that we're doing. Because when you start collecting by yellow pan traps, by all the other kinds of ways of collecting, suddenly the numbers of species that are going to arrive here and their biologies is going to go way over where the malaise trapping is. Well, let's look at malaise traps just for a few minutes. Some of the things we've learned. This is Mike Sharkey put a Taiwan trap, the one that we all use, that Paul uses, a planetary biotary mission that's everywhere used, over here. And this is a Santé trap made by, by uh, Mike Sharkey's wife. Run for a week, right side by side like this. Look at the difference in the number of insects in those two traps. The difference between a Santé trap and a Taiwan trap is two things. One is, if you notice here, you can see through the center panel. It's more translucent. So you would think you're looking right through it. That's the flying insect. He doesn't think it's a wall and back off, all right? The second thing is that the hole, the entrance hole into the bottle up here is about twice the size of what it is on a Taiwan trap, okay? And in fact, these come from a company, uh, you know, I said it's by the Hawk Company, have got even a bigger hole here or a really big hole here. You want to jack up the number of things you're catching in a malaise trap? Just increase the size of the hole. And make this more translucent if you can. And then, here's another thing. We were like entomologists, innocent, catching stuff, all right? So we go out and put traps out willy-nilly. Discovered very quickly that these two traps right here, this one right here, and this one, you can just barely make it out. It's right there in the, in the, in the shade. Or that one, they're about four meters apart like that, right? You can see a big chunk of insects here in the bottom of this one and nothing, basically, in this one. These two traps turn out to have this thing here had 80,000 insects in it. This one over here had 8,000 insects in it. Now, why? Because the bottle here is aimed into the shade. The bottle over here is aimed into the sun. The insects come flying into the trap, and if you're a sun-loving thing, you go up against this ballet and you don't get caught. If you're a shade-loving insect, you go towards the shade and you get caught in the bottle. 
Now we turn the trap around the other way around, and now you're the, the sun-loving insect, which are a lot more of them, of course, in the, in the edge of the forest here, and you go right into the bottle. And the shade-loving ones get into the, the blunt end that don't. So think, little differences like that make an enormous difference in what you're comparing and how you catch it. And Sharkey noticed this, that if you take and put a baffle right here on the side of the trap with a six inch gap between this edge right here and the actual trap wall, you double the collection of Molly's trap. Because the insects come along and hit that baffle and the baffle guides them into the trap. So now we know what the tool is, all right? You, you guys understand the, bio, the, the barcode tool. You now, I'm talk a little bit about the physical tool. So here's the actual use of one. Here's the ACG again. This is a, uh, a big volcano here. And on the side of the big volcano is a uh, desires for a geothermal project. This is what it looks like. Here's the forest up here. This is us, the ACG. This is private land out here owned by the electric company over here, and they want to put a, Malaysia, they want to put a, a, a geothermal drilling process up here right on our boundary. So why does this matter? Well, you see, that's the real source. That's the resource. I don't need that all that blue. That could produce a quarter of Costa Rica's electricity. So we're talking about serious industrial impact, but serious industrial impact can wipe out the, the biology of this forest, which is sitting right here. So the question comes in, how do you get it out of there? And how much damage are you doing when you go in there to get it out? Well, here's what the drilling site actually looks like. A hole cut out of the forest like that, with an entrance road coming up through here like that. This is 2014. So we go, if I, again, I, want to, I don't have time to go into the details here, but what happened basically was the electric company came to the ACG and described their plans. That's like Google going to Apple and telling Apple what they're going to do for the next five years. Okay. Because the electric company and the park service have been at war with each other for as long as I've been working in Costa Rica. Okay. They hate each other for a whole lot of different reasons. So I hear this guy get up here and give a talk about what they're going to do. I raised my hand and I said, um, no, I said to the park director, I said, can I throw myself into that? He said, well, you can try. So I raised my hand and I said, imagine that NSF just gave me $5 million to ask the question, what is the impact on a forest if you put a road through a tropical forest? You put a road through it and you cut a two hectare soccer field out of it. You guys are doing that. I don't have the $5 million, but would you let me treat that as though it was my own research project? And they thought amongst themselves as well, as long as it doesn't cost us anything, you can do it. So that's how this project originated, okay, with Meridad's nine Malay straps. So we asked them for a double map that showed exactly where everything was going to go. Here's the map, there's the road in it, there's the platform that's going to be right there. And um, you can barely make out the lines, but you see the yellow line running up there like that, one running that way, and one off of here, off the road. The idea was to put a Malay strap on the margin, 50 meters in and 150 meters in, on these three different lines. And then ask, what do those malaise traps tell you about the impact of the drilling site? Well, that's how it looks when it starts. I mean, we're looking like, it looks like a, a bomb land on it, right? This is gorgeous original forest here, okay? And there's the malaise trap, right there where the first bulldozers go through and take the first sets of trees out. This is as the project is being developed more. There's the malaise trap right there. And this is when the project is in full-scale industrial operation. There's the Malay strap right there. So every week, somebody goes and empties those, Malay, those nine Malay straps. Okay. Now, this is an actual contract agreement. Okay. Why does the electric company even really care? Why, why would they let us go and interfere and be there without our helmets and all this kind of stuff? And, 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 and in, in effect, interfering, at least in a traditional sort of way. Because the Japanese government had invested $800 million in that drilling site. So we're talking about major, major activity, and suddenly they don't want to get an environmental black eye from having done something wrong in this piece of forest. Okay? So we have an actual contract now between the Japanese government, basically, 
and us as crazy biologists, all right? So they put actual documents and all this stuff with what we're going to do and what we're not going to do and so forth, because I'm trying to get them to pay for the sequencing costs. This is the red up here is the first draft of the contract put to us by the Japanese government. And if you read along through it, it says right here, environmental impact assessment and not for research itself. Explicitly, you cannot, oh, it was told verbally as well, you cannot do research with this money. And I said, well, then forget it. We're out of here. Because everything we do is research. Well, back and forth and back and forth. So finally, the new contract just ends with that period right there. They, <laughs> they sliced off this little last piece up there. Okay. So what do we end up with as a result? Each line running along here is the number of species caught per week, or number of bins per week, if you like, for those nine traps, except for this trap up here. We're going to focus on that trap as opposed to these down here. But Immediately looking at these results here, what you can find yourself saying is, here's the drilling itself. You know, lights and noise and all that kind of stuff. Is that blue line down here? There's no way to pick that blue line out of these lines running through these malaise traps here. But you can see the rainy season. It starts right there, and it's, of course, reflected in this bigger one up here. And then it drops after the rainy season. Then as the animals come out of the pupae and larvae and all that, we get another peak going up there. But the point is, these are graphical, numerical data. This is not a tree hugger standing out there saying how horrible it looks. This is real information about what actually was taking place. And engineers like real information. They understand it. They're willing to sit and listen and talk and learn what this means. Whereas the reaction of the tree huggers is complete no way, OK? So where do we get that data? This is 144,000 insects in one year from, nine malaise, from seven malaise traps sent in little bags to Guelph. So we get them. They go in the DHL, and they come up here. And this crew up here takes those bags apart and does the whole process. And I get back real information. That is like sending your film to Kodak in the old days, and you'll get back the slides all nicely developed. And you have no idea what Kodak did to that roll of film, but it gave you back the slides that you wanted. All right? That's how it's seen by the user community. Okay? That, that was, they took them six months to do that. Okay? And that worked out to $3.14 per insect. The little bit of, of here, stuck on here, was the cost of lace traps and alcohol and some bottles and things like that. But basically, so we're talking about $3 an insect back in 2016, OK? And that was 11,000 species. Okay, sorry, 11,000 bins, sorry. So, um, I'm not obviously not going into detail on some of this stuff, which I'd love to do. Um, now, so we asked the question, and we had all these different traps. How different are they? Could you have just used two? or three, or one. Well, here's the three in deep shade. And the colors are the different orders of insects. And you can see the three in deep shade look like, boy, they're practically identical. Why didn't we just have one trap? If you look at the species in those, there's only a 13% over overlap between those three traps. They're on one three hectares in deep shade in this forest. A 13% overlap between three trucks. Okay. If you take one family, oops, sorry, in this case, the city of Miami, these percentages that you see up here are the percentages in the deep shade traps of one family. Those are all different species. There's 2,000 species that came out of those traps of one little dinky little fly. Okay. And the numbers in total are just climbing and climbing and climbing and climbing. So what we're really saying, of course, is that we're just sampling a little piece of the system. And even that's giving us information right now. And here's the kind of information it gives you. See the red line running up here? That's that one trap, OK? The one the trap that looks like this. Why is that different? Well, here's the map of where it is. See, that's the trap right there. Number three, see, it's right on the margin of this plot right here. If you walk in to number two, which is 50 meters in, 
you have no idea that the platform exists. It turns out that that showed the engineers perfectly that the damage they're doing is the cookie cutter and not 100 meters, 200 meters, long distances in. You can stand at trap number two and see the platform. It's right there. But it's not impacting. And we're using the insects now as a thermometer. Okay. So where do the insects come from that pile up in here? They're coming in part for the canopy down, because you, of course, created canopy down here when you do the drilling site. So this butterfly, which lives normally up here, has come down here, laid an egg right there, which grew up into this caterpillar. Okay, so we, can, we know that because we have this other information, because we've been rearing these things for years. Right? And the other thing that's there are these kind of agricultural insects and agricultural plants that exist in the fields and roadsides and pastures all through the area. They all immediately showed up here on the margin between the drilling area and the forest itself. So we created a little frame of disturbed world around it, full of these kinds of insects here. And I can, I'm watching my time here, so I'm not gonna, I'm gonna skip over that slide. I'm not gonna deal with it. So we ended up looking down, and I said, I'm an engineer. I'm an environmentally, uh, environmental consultant. I'm a AEI guy who makes my living doing environmental reports. And I'm looking down on this drilling site. What I see is this ugly hole cut in the forest. We call it a platform. I sat there and stared at it and suddenly realized, nope, that's a landslide. And parks are full of landslides. Look at them. Are those Issei drilling sites? No, they're landslides. And the biologists don't cringe, they don't quench, they don't worry, they don't complain, nothing. But when you put a drilling platform in the middle of it, everybody gets very excited. Okay. The second thing is, people say, oh yeah, but then these things here all fill in by the vegetation eventually. It comes back on it and says, and the drilling site's going to stay open now for 20 years, 30 years, whatever it happens to be. Ah. This is an edge. This is an edge that's going to stay open forever. It's a river going through your national park. It's just like the margin of the drilling platform. Instead of being asphalt or, or paved concrete or whatever it must be, it's water. But the point being is it is a perturbation. And we can now take this industrial perturbation and analog it to natural perturbations. The striking thing is that the electric company ended, generated this slide right here, which is the park system here. This is the industrial system here. And here's JICA, the Japanese government, lubricating, pushing the two together. And the way they lubricated it was pay the bill for all the barcoding that this operation did here, which was $425,000 in six months. Okay. Now, there are byproducts from this. I know I'm getting close to the end here. There are byproducts from this. These are little black flies. You all, everybody knows black flies, right? They come and bite you. And I, there's on my hand there, and I squashed it, so there's the blood off the black fly. And um, by going into Bold and then going into, into Google, I got ended up with this paper that's been done on Mexican black flies. It's the taxonomy of it, and we compared it with the barcodes, and we even have names to go through these things. And, um, sorry. And so we end up with a bunch of species the black flies over here, out of the maze traps. So I'm scratching my head thinking, well, it's eating blood out of me. And so I, I got right a note to Evgeny, who is sitting over there somewhere here. I didn't, where did he go? He disappeared, I guess. OK. Uh, he's out there somewhere. <laughs> there he is, over there. He was just up here shortly ago. And I said, Evgeny, can you, can you do a barcode now of the gut contents of these flies? They've already done the, the for, he's already done a pass through for the insects. Can you do it for the gut contents? And he says, well, I'll try. So he comes back at me with this list of things that had, and these are the records over here, I won't worry about that. Here's a list of birds fed on by these black flies. And then here's mammals down through here. And I looked at this list and I didn't, I was being sloppy and I just looked at it and uh, thought, oh, you know, there's, there's, a, there's a mannequin right there. I, you know, I know these, these generic names, and so they were feeding on our birds and our mammals. Winnie, who's a bird nut, looks over my shoulder at the list and says, damn, those are not Costa Rican birds. Huh? 
they're from Peru, they're Ecuadorian, they're South American. Turned out that nobody's ever barcoded the birds of Costa Rica. So you don't have reference barcodes for the birds of Costa Rica, but you have them for Peru or Ecuador. And they're similar enough to ours from Costa Rica so that it was easy to put up the names here, which actually are South American names. And of course, I innocently just took those as what the flies are feeding on. So then I started to look more closely. And down here at the bottom is a mouse, Paramiscus. And we have Paramiscus all over the place, which I had seen Paramiscus. Fine, they're feeding on Paramiscus mice. But then I looked up the species, and this is an endemic in southern Mexico, which again, the Mexicans have barcoded it, but the Costa Ricans have not. And so the names got confused because they're similar enough, OK? This is an NJ tree of little beetles, scolitid beetles, out of those same Malay traps. These are the ones we're talking about around the geothermal site. La Broca is a very, very important coffee pest in Costa Rica. Drills into the coffee fruit, and the fruit is aborted. Everybody knows it, La Broca. There's what it is there, and everybody identifies it. No problem, right? We barcode them in that one site. From the drilling site, there are 11 species of La Broca there at that one point in those Malay tribes. This is a major economic pest in Costa Rica. Everybody's been treating it as one thing. It's at least 11, and it could well be a lot more. Okay. Now, I'm going to beg about five more minutes of your time, but I'm going to whip through a couple of things here. Since this is about the politics and the, the, the society linkage that makes this all happen. So we get invited to go to the COP 13 last year, two years ago, in Cancun, and do a presentation about this, which we did. Notice it's on the margin of a UNESCO World Heritage Site. That's viewed as very important in the political environmental world because we have a lot of cases around the world where the resource is right at the edge. So how can you, how can you monitor and, and evaluate the damage potential or actual being done, okay? And, we, and this is being done now with insects instead of camera traps and birds and all that sort of stuff. So the outcome of that is that the Minister of the Environment, the CEO of the electric company, the head engineer over here, the vice minister over here, um, and they, oh yeah, and the Vice Minister of Energy over here, all come down to look at a map and understand the site and see the site and see the physical reality of this thing. So we're sitting there at lunch afterwards, and I get brave enough to say to the minister, um, you know, why don't we park with the whole country? And he just sort of went by like that, and then it came back again, and then the ambassador from Costa Rica in Washington, D.C., called him up and said, um, you know, I think you ought to have Jansen come and give a presentation in the ministry uh, about this thing. So we went and did that. And at um, the end of my way too long, two hour presentation, um, he pulls up a chair and sits down in it. And he puts me in the other chair and he says, okay, what do you want? And I said, I want to be allowed, politically allowed, to, put, to DNA bark the whole country. He says, it's a go. And so the outcome of that was a decree, a formal government decree, which does a very interesting thing. This is the actual decree itself. And, um, and in, inside is the text. Basically, it says, the seminar, the information, free, 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 free public, and free uh, cost-wise, and, and barcodes are called innovative technical informa informatic, tech uh, innovative te technical informatics. Okay, that's the, the jargon word instead of using the word barcode. The new decree, which is being rough drafted right now, will actually say barcode. Okay, and so the idea being that this is all to promote development. Of, 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 of political incentives for publication, for free publication of information over biodiversity. That sets the government up for green light approval for all this kind of stuff that we're doing in Costa Rica. So the new president who comes in, oh, excuse me, I, I don't want to, well, the new president who comes in just in May of this year um, 
ends up getting a big blessing of green, of green from the World Bank, which is $12 million. And uh, this is the fellow Carlos Manuel right here, who's doing the, the minister, the new minister, who's now doing a, um, a new decree, which will actually save our coding for the country. Okay. And finally, as Junko mentioned in the CBD meeting uh, last year, in 2016, I mean, two years ago, the, but it, the international support for the market of life was formalized up there, and now it's the big topic, or one of the big topics, at Egypt coming up in a couple, in about a month. Now, we'll run right down to the end of this. The whole goal here is to get everybody in the country all doing it together, okay? All these different government agencies, universities, private world, the commercial world, the NGOs, all working together to get the raw material from the field and bring it in here and get it organized and land it on Paul's desk, okay? So the idea is that we're talking about creating a huge flow of information plunked up here, and the government is on board with that. And where is it actually going to come from? All these white areas, of course, are the, conser are, the, are the conserved wildland areas of Costa Rica. This is a map of the places where there's an electrical outlet done by the National Electric Company. I say, ask them, would, would you, yeah, sure, here you go, there it is. And they're all in national parks. These are, excuse me, electrical outlets in national parks. So you can go out there and put a freezer out there, run your malaise traps off the staff of the national park, and then they put them in there and, and then you collect the stuff, all right? The National Electric Company does the same thing. They say, we want to have malaise traps sitting around our installations. You go to the little tourist outfits, with the you know people, the bird watchers in the rainforest, that sort of stuff, you put a lace trap up there, and then they have something that they can explain to their clients. This is a map of the high schools in Costa Rica. You get every one of those high schools, or two of them, or five of them, or 25 of them, and how, many, how much money you have to do the sequencing, and you put it out there, and they run it, and this is a Canadian one from Paul's major, uh, uh, school malaise trap problem. There are 50,000 farms in Costa Rica that could be doing this. Every one of these triangles is a piece of forest that an owner owns and is being paid by the government not to cut down. Well, you can then go to that person and say, would you run a rice trap, a malaise trap in your forest? That the government's subsidizing you not to cut down? Sure you will. So that's the sort of thing that's coming down the road. Now, the last piece at the very end here is, here's the world we're living. You see the heavy cloud? Well, you can't see it here, I guess, can you? There's a heavy cloud layer on the top of this volcano. Now there's just a little bit, and now there's basically none. That's the impact of climate change on Costa Rica. This is a day on the top of one of those volcanoes, when for this butterfly, that's a marvelous day, okay? Barely, you can barely see. And here's the caterpillar that goes with it. See, these things sit on the foliage with droplets of water on their wings. And this is the way it looks in its world, in the real world, pre-climate change. This is the way it looks today. This is Death Valley. Where is that other world? Is it? We can now use the whole biodiversity of Costa Rica as a biothermometer for the whole changes that are taking place across the country. And it's bringing on far more than just drying out and heating up. These are army ants on the top of the volcano. Ten years ago, there weren't any army ants on top of the volcano. And they weren't out there. So that if you lived in the litter, you weren't threatened by. You've all seen the German well, I guess you can barely see it now, can't you? The decline of insect dense, uh, biomass in the German malaise trap running down. This is not a phenomenon of Germany. This is the world, okay? So where, where do we end up with the, with the uh, climate change uh, edict that just came out about worrying about 1.5 degrees centigrade? Look at the text of this thing. A wide, we're calling for a wide portfolio of mitigation options and significant upscaling of investments in these options. And they're talking about biodiversity options going along with the climate change. And Paul's, of course, already there with his planetary biodiversity system. And this is really where we're headed is that everybody's got their own GPS for biodiversity, for any biodiversity, and the biodiversity that you guys are all talking about in your databases, and the way you get to it is with something that costs that in your back pocket, okay? In 2003, when Paul got in this huge argument with the genome people in Cold Spring Harbor, 
I got very frustrated with this conversation because it was obvious that it was the way it should go. And I stood up and I pulled my comb out of my back pocket and I said to all these people, Paul, what you're doing is what I read about when I was in high school in the 50s. And now it's real. And I want to see what you're talking about in something that costs this in everybody's back pocket. And Paul turned around and said, you've raised the bar. And I said to him, that's the only bar that counts. Okay. We're almost there. Not quite, but we're getting there pretty fast. But the striking thing is, this is what Nanopore is very, very proud of right now, but it's $45 per insect. Paul's headed for $1 to $3 per insect or even less. Okay. So I want to close with these two slides. What do these things have in common? The printing press, the Model T forward, the Kodak camera, the cell phone, and the Wright brothers. What's in common in all those things? There's somebody there, something there for everyone in those things. And that is what is driving and should be driving the whole barcode development. Thank you.